So, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, I have a very special guest and a very special friend with me today. If I was ever put in jail, uh, the person that I would want uh, looking after me would be this man, Brother Al-Hajj Mori. And uh, he is the best American writer when it comes to Islam and geopolitics. He will touch cases no one will uh, no one else will no other muslim will want to touch he'll help people that are really in difficult cases uh because of islam because because of being muslim and uh, you know care does what it does alhamdulillah it, whatever they do is good but there are certain cases care is not going to touch those are the cases that this brother is going to touch and if I'm ever in prison, I don't think uh, care will be helping me much. But, you know, they do what they do, and everybody has a role and a purpose. Uh, Brother Mori is the best writer. If you want to read good English writing uh, from an Islamic perspective, uh, this is the man. He knows how to talk to the media. He knows how to talk to, like, he, he, just, he just knows that world. And one of the cases he's working on is Afia Siddiqui. And uh, he's, you know, he's the man to go to when you want to understand what's happening, right? Particularly, uh, so, so he's, he's the person. So now let's start with uh, some basic questions, uh, Brother Mori. Um, do you want to say anything about yourself that I didn't say? <laughs> well, I am, you know, by the grace and mercy of Allah to Allah, especially by Allah's mercy, I am a... Uh, you know, I, I strive to be a committed Muslim and uh, the Islam, uh, the, the Islam is actually the, uh, uh, the generator of, of the work that, that we have been blessed to do. Um, I, I fall under the, the title uh, often of human rights advocate. But uh, the human rights adv advocacy that we have been engaged in, it, it clearly and, and unquestionably comes through the prism of Islam. And so whatever you know, good you know, we've been able to do over the years, it's been by the power and the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, and uh, you know, as, as it has in, uh, just, uh, it impacted our heart, you know, uh, and it's not just me, you know, uh, oftentimes folks have seen Brother Salakan and, you know, some <laughs> uh, view me as this, you know, this one man army and uh, on the critic side, the one man show, they like to derisively dismiss me as a one man show. But, you know, really, we have we have a board. The Afia Foundation has a small board of directors and we have a solid base, uh, Sheikh Omar. We have a solid base. It's not that big, but it's it's solid of consistent support that we've received uh, from, uh, you know, these brothers and a few sisters consistently over the years uh, that has enabled us to do what we do. So it's not just me. It's it's. Uh, it's a small army of us, by the grace of Allah. So uh, for those people that don't know about Afia Siddiqui's case, yeah, let me just give the overall view. And then maybe because there's some people that are not from Pakistan specifically that would still be interested in this case just as a case study and some of the questions that come out of it. So in that sense, it's important just being Muslim. And then uh, so, you know, she was captured. Uh, in Pakistan as a Pakistani citizen, uh, basically a, a abducted, taken to Afghanistan, where she was then blamed for shooting FBI agents, even though she's very weak, less than 100 pounds, uh, brought to the U.S., charged for, uh, I guess, 83 years in prison for whatever, I don't know the ex exact specification. 86, yes. 86 years. Um, and, and this is an innocent person who was a student of MIT, uh, you know, she was getting into the deen, she was becoming vocal about the deen, and, uh, and then, you know, uh, she, she's gone through a tremendous amount of 
you can say torture psychologically, emotionally. So my first question to you is, does the Pakistani government not have the will to help her? In the because, word, you know, no. what we hear in the Pakistani news, you know, the Pakistani mm -hmm. narrative keeps talking about how she's going to get released and how if Imran Khan became president, she'll get released. And if this happened, they'll, she'll get released. And that Imran Khan is working on getting her released. But every time we hear that, two years go by and then nothing happens. Yeah, well, the, the short answer, Aki, is no. I mean, up until now, the, the Pakistani government, uh, through a number of administrations, beginning with the administration that shamefully handed her over, we believe sold her for a bounty, as yeah. many Muslims were being sold for bounties during the uh, presidency of Musharraf. Um, beginning with that government, all the way through to where we are today, uh, the Pakistani government as an entity has not been willing to do what it is capable of doing in order to get the daughter of the nation, quote unquote, returned to her homeland. And let me also say as, a, as just a matter of, of, of small but very important clarification, Aki, uh, words are, are, are important. And I don't know if you've seen the Wikipedia on Afia Siddiqui is one of the longest uh, Wikipedia files that I've ever come across. It's one of the longest, if not the, in fact, of all the Wikipedia files that I've seen over the years, this one is the longest. And it's filled with a lot of uh, malicious uh, disinformation. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm sure that, you know, some of the uh, leading uh, propagandists responsible for Afia's file on Wikipedia uh, have been Zionists, both, you know, uh, Christian as well as Jewish Zionists. And um, there's just a lot of disinformation. There's a lot of stuff that's already been disproven. But unfortunately, because Wikipedia has been a go-to source for you know, uh, uh, so many of us, you know, I go there uh, quite often and, and, and I value Wikipedia with the exception of political imprisonment issues. You know, I think it's, it's a good source of information, but when it comes to issues like political imprisonment, it's not a good source. You have to be very, very careful. And on Afia, with respect to Afia, there's just a lot of disinformation. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, to use the term captured is, is, in my humble opinion, improper because she wasn't captured. She was not, uh, Afia was not on the run when she was kidnapped. Okay. She and her children were kidnapped in March of 2003 and renditioned uh, and then disappeared for a period of five years from 2003 to 2008. So, uh, you know, the, the wording that we use to describe yes, what yes. happened to her. Yes, she was not captured, she was, ki she was kidnapped. She yes. was kidnapped. Hmm. Yeah, so uh, so in your opinion, the Pakistani government, they haven't even tried to correct the Wikipedia file, according to you, <laughs> you know, this is something Allah. basic, you know, they haven't even Allah. tried to try to do that. So forget about like, getting her out of prison. Um, and why is this case with Afia specifically, so important, uh, symbolically, I guess, would be the question. Okay, years ago, by the grace and mercy of Allah Ta'ala, um, before he passed away, I had a pretty close relationship with uh, the former U.S. Attorney General Ramsey Clark. I uh, uh, helped, I, I was one of the facilitators for him traveling actually to Pakistan some years uh, back uh, and spending time in Pakistan with Afia's family and frontline supporters. Go, uh, going to different venues and speaking about her. After he returned from Pakistan, um, we had invited him to join us in Texas where we were having a mobilization and he did. Um, the former US Attorney General, I emphasize US Attorney General and one of the most, uh, up until the time he passed away, one of the most respected uh, former government officials who was still alive. When he uh, tried to visit Afia, 
at FMC Carswell in Fort Worth. They lied to him. They told him that Afia did not want to receive his visit. Mm -hmm. And she didn't come to find out until, you know, after the fact, days after the fact that he had attempted to visit her. Now he was able to visit another political prisoner who we were all so concerned uh, uh, about. And uh, she has since passed a lawyer by the name of Lynn Stewart, um, mm -hmm. who uh, incurred the wrath of the establishment when she became one of the appeals attorneys for uh, the, the late Sheikh Omar Abdelrahman. May Allah be pleased with him. Those people um, that don't remember, uh, he was the one who was the blind imam who was falsely yeah. accused for trying to plot against the U.S. And yes. again, no one stood up for him, that particular sheikh, other than uh, Brother Mori. So, yeah, alhamdulillah, we, um, he was able to visit Lynn Stewart, but he couldn't visit Afia Siddiqui. And um, I, I remember it was either later that evening or the next evening. I think it was that same evening. Uh, that he arrived uh, in Texas. We had arranged for him to deliver a lecture uh, at one of the largest centers in the DFW area, the Islamic Center of Irving. Mm -hmm. And I'll never forget his words in his address that evening. He said, um, the case of Afia Siddiqui uh, is the worst case of individual injustice I have ever witnessed. And those, those words stuck with me for two reasons. One, because this was um, the retired US Attorney General, who was the Attorney General of the United States during one of the most turbulent decades in American history during the 1960s. He is a, a man now, at that time he was in his 80s. And he had been all over the world. He had seen much, a constitutional scholar, and also a man who was well-versed in international human rights and international law. And he described the case of Afia Siddiqui as the worst case of individual injustice he had ever witnessed. When he mm. said those words, Zaki, wallahi, I said to myself, man, this is how I have felt for all of the years that I have been involved in her case. And I became involved in Afia's case a year after uh, she was brought back to the United States, barely clinging to life. In 2008, she was brought back to the US. In 2009 is when I became involved in her case. And of all the cases I've been involved in, involving Muslims and non-Muslims, this has been the worst of the worst of the worst. Now, why? There's a couple of reasons why Afia's uh, uh, case is so significant. One is because um, she is a Muslim woman. And, and as you know, Sheikh Omar, we have a special obligation to Muslim women mm -hmm. who are prisoners. I mean, we have, a, we have a special obligation to all prisoners. We have a special obligation to anyone and everyone who is being oppressed, whether they are Muslim or non-Muslim. We have an obligation to the oppressed, according to our Islam. But when it comes to Muslim women, that is a notch much higher in, on, on the realm of obligation. And Afia Siddiqui, if that, if that were not enough, Afia Siddiqui is not just, you know, any Muslim woman. I mean, Afia Siddiqui was, you know, subhanAllah, she is a, she is a young sister was a young sister who came to the United States full of promise, full of promise, Aki. I mean, she spent her first year as a freshman at the University of Houston. We're gonna be in Houston uh, uh, next week, inshallah ta'ala. On, on my, in fact, no, no, um, wait, wait, today is, no, later this week. I'm gonna be leaving for Houston on Wednesday. We're gonna, uh, inshallah ta'ala, we should be in Houston on, on Thursday night. And then on Monday, we're gonna have a rally, a, our first support rally in this five city series. It's gonna be in front of the Houston consulate, the Pakistani consulate in Houston. But her entry into the United States in 1990 was Houston, Texas. 
and Afia as a freshman was an outstanding student. I mean, she ended up getting a full scholarship from there to MIT, a full scholarship. And Afia was known for her, not just for her academic prowess, she was also known for her commitment to Islam. You know, many of the viewers will, will I'm sure have seen, and those of you who haven't, you owe it to yourself to go to YouTube and watch this short video, 18, 19 minutes long, of, an, of, of a 19 year old Afia Siddiqui dressed in all yellow. She is delivering a speech at the University of Houston. This is just before she left for MIT. Uh, she's at the end of her freshman year. And the, uh, Emma, uh, the, uh, 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 the president of the uh, Muslim Students Association, when he introduced her, he said, Afia Siddiqui has already been designated the Dawa coordinator at MIT, even before she got there. She was already designated. Why? This is how far her reputation went. Mm. And, and so, and, 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 and that also emanated from a well of deep spiritual commitment. Afia Siddiqui is a hafid of Quran. Oh, and so, you know, this is where all of that came from. So, so Afia is not just, you know, I mean, and I, I don't, I don't like, I hope people don't misunderstand the kind of uh, misunderstand what I'm saying when I'm saying she's not just any Muslim sister. It, you know, all of our Muslim sisters are precious. They're 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 valuable. They they they, they are very. Uh, their their blood their their honor is sacred for a committed Muslim male. All of them, but Afia she was a notch above. The average. And so when the US government went after Afia Siddiqui based upon either a mistake or deliberate manipulation, Allah knows best. Either or, when they went after her, they were sending a message loud and clear to the Muslim community in America that we have targeted you know, the best <laughs> uh, uh, among your women, one, one, of, one of the best among your, your women, what are you gonna do about it? And subhanAllah, now it's been 18 years and Afia Siddiqui is still where she is. And we have not done as a communal force in America much about it. Mm. Do you know much about her uh, situation right now? How is she right now? How is she psychological? I guess the other thing I'd be interested in is how does a Muslim lady that's been through this, how is she psychologically coping with this? It's been difficult, Aki. You know, Afia, as was exhibited clearly, I mean, we saw clear indications of how strong she was in her deen, in her you know, in, in her faith, her iman, her, it was just very, very rock solid. We saw how strong it was, you know, during the trial. I was there in the courthouse in, in lower Manhattan every day of that trial. And I witnessed it from start to finish. And, and, and I saw there were glimpses every now and then we, we, we would get a glimpse in how, Afia would react to something or, or what she might say every now and then of the trauma, the mental and psychological trauma that she had already been put through. We saw glimpses of it then. But for the most part, because of the rock solid nature of her Iman and her devotion to uh, Islam and her belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I believe that is what really sustained this sister from you know, um, uh, reacting, you know, having the worst type of reaction to all that she had been put through in those five years that she was missing. And Afia was put through a lot. She was put through a lot. Mm. Uh, some, some of which we know, other of which we don't know, but she has been put through a lot. And since that trial ended in 2010, 11, no, January, it was January or February 2011 when, when they had uh, the, uh, the sentencing. Uh, mm. September 
is when uh, 2010 is when the trial began. And I think it was either January or February when the sentencing took place. So since that time, all the years she's been at FMC Carswell, an institution in Fort Worth, Texas that has a vile reputation, all right, um, for abusing female prisoners. We know that Afi has been through a lot and uh, there are clear indications of it, you know. But the good thing now is that for a long period of time, for about three years or so, uh, at least two or three years, Afia was completely cut off from the outside. Mm. But now, alhamdulillah, she has an attorney, a young attorney that goes in to see her once a month. And the last time that the attorney saw Afia was in uh, uh, it was about, about a month ago, and uh, she reported um, after seeing Afia that she had been attacked, viciously attacked by one of the female inmates, much bigger than she, and, and she attacked her in a very vicious way um, with a hot, scalding hot pot of coffee that she smashed into Afia's face. Um, you know, she ended up uh, on the floor in a fetal position and had to be wheelchaired out. She was very fortunate uh, not to have lost her sight. Um, but, um, you know, she's, Afia is in danger. And you know, subhanAllah, initially, Sheikh, initially, I mean, we had already had these five mobilizations planned. We had already had these five city mobilizations planned before this happened. Um, we wanted to do five city, a five city mobilization thread because, you know, for over a year, we haven't been able to do anything for Afia because of the pandemic. So we wanted to try to make up for it and, and, and also to take advantage of this atmosphere that we're in right now with so much attention being focused on social and political justice related issues. So we decided, okay, we're going to do this five city mobilization Initially, we were planning that Boston, where she spent most of her years in the United States being educated at MIT and then Brandeis. She got her PhD in cognitive neuroscience from Brandeis University. Uh, and then the second city we would go into would be New York around the same time that the UN uh, uh, annual UN assembly was taking place. And then the third and fourth cities would be Fort Worth, and, uh, and Houston, and then the last city would be Washington DC, the nation's capital. But what we decided after Afia was attacked was that we needed to make Texas first. Mm -hmm. So Houston will be the first city we'll have the mobilization in. It'll be in front of the, uh, uh, the uh, Pakistani council in Houston uh, a week from today, next Monday. And then the following Saturday, we will be in Fort Worth outside the gates of Carswell, where mm -hmm. Afia is being held, uh, inshallah ta'ala. And then from there, from uh, uh, Texas, we will then head to Boston. We will do the mobilization in Boston. In fact, no, no I'm sorry. We're going to head from there to, to New York City because we want to do the mobilization in New York City, uh, again, during the time of the General Assembly. So we're gonna have the third mobilization there. The fourth mobilization will be in Boston. And then the final mobilization in October will be in Washington, DC, inshallah. Now, uh, two things. Number one, is there a website where people can go get information? And yes, those of you yes. that are listening to me, please, if you know people that are well-to-do, especially people that are religious minded, especially send them this video so that they, if they, you know, if Allah opens their heart, they can join uh, uh, the cause at one level or another, whether you're giving donations or you're going out there and demonstrating whatever Allah allows you to do. You know, if, if you send out this video and give it to somebody and they end up giving sadaqah, or if they end up going and doing the protest, then you'll get that reward. So inshallah, you know, we owe it to our sister to do That's that. Right. So, That's right. Um, so uh, okay, so she's doing a little bit better, but she's still in danger. 
She and I is guess very, the, very much the best, yes. the best result for the U.S. would probably be that she just dies, right? Problem solved. It'd be best for Pakistan. And it would be best for the U.S. that if they can somehow just get rid of her. So I'm just saying that. So, um, and inshallah, that'll never happen. Uh, Allah knows best what he plans. Uh, what would be your message, A, to the Pakistani embassy? Number two, the Pakistani elite. Uh, what advice do you give them on what they should do and how they should do what they should do? Aki, I, um, when I'm talking about these issues in the public square, whether it is among Muslims or non-Muslims, I like to reference history and I like to reference the you know, famous quotations or some quotations that are not so famous of prominent figures that have come and gone, prominent figures that are held in high esteem by pockets of the, the local, national or global community. Um, one of the things I often say to my brothers and sisters when I speak at Masajid and centers about Afia Siddiqui and the many other political prisoners. I mean, we're not just concerned about Afia Siddiqui. Uh, we're concerned about Imam Jamil Abdullah Al Amin. Yes, uh, of course. He's, his case is another case. Yes, we should that, talk about that one day too. Because yes, as his as case is another case that, that that symbolizes yeah. a. Um, a, a, a significant litmus test for Muslims and non-Muslims in America. Um, and then there are so many others whose names are not as prominent as Afia and Imam Jamil that we're concerned about. There are hundreds, hundreds of political prisoners in the United States. And, and, and over the past 20 years, post 9-11, the vast majority of this new generation of political prisoners are Muslim. Mm. So we're concerned about them all. Uh, but, you know, again, there, there are certain cases that represent such a large um, uh, litmus test and, and are so precedent setting, are so precedent setting that if you can, if you can get a victory um, with those cases, it will have a ripple effect on others, inshallah hmm. ta'ala. And so the, the obvious case, Imam Jamil's case, these, these, these are cases that represent uh, that type of uh, precedent setting potential. So we, 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 we're asking our, our brothers and sisters to understand, uh, number one, um, that we should not wait for something like this to happen to them you know, or to someone that they love before they become concerned. And then we, we like to reference again, these, these prominent personages in history. You know, Sheikh Ibn Taymiyyah, uh, Rahmatullah Alayh, he said, civilization is based on justice and the consequences of oppression are devastating. Therefore, it is said Allah aids the just state, even if it is non-Muslim and withholds his help from the oppressive state, even if it is Muslim. Mm -hmm. You know, he, he made this observation and then generations later, uh, a prominent figure from the Western uh, uh, bloc, uh, socio-political bloc, made basically the same observation using different words, you know? Thomas Jefferson, uh, one of the founding fathers of this quote unquote republic, this contradiction mm -hmm. in, in democracy, uh, the third president of the United States of America. If you ever visit the Jefferson Memorial in Washington DC and you walk up into the memorial, you'll read some of the inscriptions of his uh, uh, around the walls. And one of those inscriptions reads, I tremble for my country when I reflect God is just, his justice cannot sleep forever. So, you know, I, when, I, when I read that quote, brother, I was so intrigued by it. I wanted to, uh, to, 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 you know, get the history behind it. And so I did some investigation and I learned that this was something that he said to one of his bosom friends in a letter, in a private letter. Mm. And in that, uh, uh, and, and I imagine that when he wrote these words, 
He wrote them, it was probably late at night in the middle of the night when everything was still and he was alone with his own conscience and contradictions because, you know, Jefferson was one of those, you know, hallowed founding fathers who was given credit as, you know, for producing the constitution and the declaration of independence and those sterling words, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal and are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights among these life, liberty, and the pursuit of slaves while he was a slaveholder. So mm -hmm. the contradictions that he himself exemplified, as well as the contradictions that were around him, is what mm -hmm. I believe led him to write those words. I tremble for my country when I reflect mm -hmm. God is just. His mm -hmm. justice cannot sleep forever. So there's a consequence for doing nothing. Is a consequence. We have an obligation to Afia Siddiqui and to all of the other wrongfully held political prisoners, uh, both Muslim and non-Muslim, to do what we can to get them freed. We have that obligation. The prophet said, when you see an evil action, change it with your hand. If you cannot do so with your tongue, the jihad of the tongue, if you cannot do so, detest it within your heart. And that is the weakest degree of faith. And the prophet also said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, by the one in whose hand rests my soul. And this was a, a profound warning that I remind myself of all the time, Sheikh Omar. By the one in whose hand rests my soul, you must surely enjoin the good and forbid the evil. Otherwise, it is expected that Allah will send against you a punishment mm -hmm. and you will supplicate him, but your supplications will not be answered. SubhanAllah. Yeah, Imam Jamil Amin and Afya Siddiqui are a, a litmus test to that, like you said, especially for Muslims in America in a way. Um, so let me just uh, broaden this up. Uh, what role do you see Islamophobia play in, in, in the coming times? Is Islamophobia, you know, because it, all these things are interrelated. And so uh, what, is, what is the future of Islamophobia in America? Well, the answer to that question depends upon us. It depends upon us and what we do. And when I say us, I'm not just referring to the Muslims. I'm referring to all people of goodwill, all people who uh, are justice, uh, truth and justice oriented, irrespective of what your creed happens to be, irrespective of what your political affiliation happens to be, irrespective of what ideological worldview you have. If you are a person who, who is really about truth and about justice for all, then it depends upon us what we do. Um, you know, that, that, that's what it really depends upon. Uh, because this, this country is, you know, there's that verse in the Quran that I'm reminded of constantly. Constantly, Aki. Constantly, you know, um, uh, uh, because, you know, the pandemic, the record-breaking natural disasters that are hitting one after another, both here and abroad, um, the, 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 the deterioration of the quality of life for the vast majority of people, you know, both here and abroad. Uh, you know, I'm reminded of what Allah says in translation of the meaning in the Quran, corruption has appeared on the land and on the sea yeah. on account of what men's hands have wrought. Allah will make them taste a part of what they have done so that they might return. We are, we are being warned repeatedly wake up, wake up before it's too late. Mm. And, you know, th these cases uh, involving these human beings are just another dimension of that wake up call that we're receiving that we had better pay attention to again before it's too late. Has the Pakistani government done anything or has it just been a show of words to the Pakistani people? Yeah, it, it, a, a periodic show of words. I mean, subhanAllah, yeah, I, I've been very disappointed. I, I visited Pakistan in 2014. 
I traveled, you know, through throughout the country in the company of the front line of supporters of Dr. Afia Siddiqui, along with her sister, uh, Dr. Fauzia Siddiqui. We traveled together uh, from Karachi, the home city, to Islamabad, the capital, visited the parliament, visited the Supreme Court, spoke with politicians high and low. Um, uh, we went from Islamabad, pa passed through, you know, by truck. We were we were traveling in a in a large truck, you know, uh, mm. uh, through the. Uh, 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 I forgot what part of that uh, the Punjab. Uh, you know, we, tra we traveled through that that territory through the um, almost yeah, in fact into the night. I remember we had one stop along the way. Um, at the home of this prominent uh, Pakistani official and his family. And then he had other prominent guests there to receive these, um, uh, the, these guests that had come, uh, that were passing through uh, to speak about Afia Siddiqui. It was a, it was a large gathering uh, over dinner. And, um, uh, and, then, and then from there, we, continued the drive, got in, I remember, right after midnight uh, to um, uh, Lahore. Oh, Lahore, uh, okay. Lahore, we, 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 we arrived at Lahore after midnight. Um, and, you know, one of the things, and, and then, you know, the, the, the other city after Lahore, we came back to Islamabad. Um, uh, and then we went from Islamabad we took that a long, in fact, we, and we had to fly, of course, from, you know, one, one, some of those points because it was just too far. But then, you know, the, um, I remember we took another long truck ride from uh, uh, Islamabad into Peshawar. And Peshawar, uh, you know, for our, our viewers that are not familiar with uh, that part of Pakistan, uh, that it, it's right next to Afghanistan. Now, in fact, that was the only time, Sheikh Omar, when I felt a little bit nervous. I was looking up into the sky, knowing that the, up there, there was a drone beaming oh. down, you know, mm. keeping tabs on what was going on below. And uh, I, I never forget, we, in every place, every place that we went when we were driving, not when we flew from Karachi to Islamabad, but when, when we were driving, uh, from one place to the other, folks along the way got word, and, and this was just like hours, you know, hours before we were going to be passing through, they got word that we were going to be coming through, and so we had these periodic stops along the way, in fact, that's what took us so long uh, mm -hmm. to get to Lahore once we, after we left the, uh, the midway point between Islamabad and Lahore and had dinner at that official's home and discussion. It took us so long because we were kept having to stop people along the way. They had been alerted that the sister of Dr. Afia Siddiqui and this American Muslim were coming through, you know, uh, and they had these impromptu rallies that were large, you know, <laughs> they were large rallies. And I really got a sense then of what it means to have that designation, daughter of the nation. I mean, I expected Karachi, the home city, to have this kind of feeling for Afia Siddiqui. I expected that. I wasn't surprised about Islamabad. That's the capital of the, of the country. Mm. But, you know, every place I went, I, when we arrived in Peshawar, I mean, subhanAllah, the, 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 the streets were full of people. I mean, full of people from, as far as you could see, we had to move... In fact, at one point, we just had to get out of the vehicle that we were in, and we had to just walk. We we just walk had to walk the rest of the way to this outdoor stadium where the rally mm -hmm. was going to be taking place, because you know the the, the the streets were just crowded with people on mm -hmm. rooftops on both sides. The the rooftops were full of folk that just wanted to get us a, a, a look at this delegation that had come through concerning Afia Sadiq. And then when we got into the small stadium. That had, yeah, I, I know at least a thousand people inside the stadium. 
it, you couldn't get everyone into the stadium. And so they had to mount speakers outside the stadium for all the people outside that were far more uh, to be able to hear what was being said in the stadium. But I saw up close and personal, the love, the concern for Afia Siddiqui and one part of Pakistan to another. And the, 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 the Pakistani government, and, and I'm sure that the military and the ISI has a lot to do with this. The Pakistani government, uh, or, or I should say the, the Pakistani governing establishment, which includes yeah. all the civilian, yeah. the, uh, uh, you know, uh, the prime minister and those below, as well as the generals uh, of the military and the, you know, the, uh, the secret operatives that operate ISI, all of them should be ashamed of themselves. In my humble opinion, they, they should be ashamed. They should be ashamed to allow any citizen uh, to experience what uh, an obvious Siddiqui has experienced, but especially someone as special as she is. And that they have allowed this to happen and that from time to time you get little, you know, mouth service, uh, you know, about wanting her back and, you know, wanting freedom for her. I mean, just, it, it's, it's sad. It's sad. It's shameful. And, and it's and, and not only shameful for the government, it's also shameful for those Pakistanis within the United States who had the ability to exert pressure, but who failed to do so because they're just blindly following their political leaders. They're blindly following the political line on Afia Siddiqui, and they don't care. You know, at the, at the they really don't care what's it's not their daughter. It's not their it's not, daughter. It's not their daughter. Yes, it's not their and, daughter. And by the way, there's some of them behave, Aki. Uh, by the way, I have seen some of our Pakistani brothers and sisters, brothers primarily, behave. You know, I I sometimes wonder. I, I'll be honest with you. I sometimes wonder if if it happened to their flesh and blood if they would even be responsive or, or, or with their, des their desire to fit in and to be comfortable within this society that is rapidly deteriorating mm. because of its contradictions. If their desire to be comfort, to have a safe and secure comfort zone within this system is such that they, if it was their own daughter, they would just throw up their hands, subhanAllah. So um, there is a website that you forwarded to me. Um, can you give that to me so I can just share that with everybody? Oh, yes. Yes, brother. Uh, www.afiaafia.org. Yes, Afia Foundation. Yes, yes. So I want nice. everyone, please go to this website. And they can donate here. I can see this, right? And yes, they can also yes. get all the news and information of the events so that they, especially if you're in Texas, if you know Muslims in Texas, forward this to them. Uh, especially if you're in Houston, forward this to them, right? And, uh, and, and, and please become part of, so on the day of judgment, you can say you did something to help your sister. Um, and also, Brother uh, Maury, if you can give me the website for your website. Uh, for oh, No, this is the actual, this is our website. This is the website for the Afia Foundation. Okay. And that's how folks can also reach me. Um, but I'll also give you the, my direct email. Uh, it's M-A-U-R-I, Maury, dot Salakan, S A A. L A K H A N at Afia A A F I A dot org. So you can reach me directly um, if, should you choose to do so. And um, and then also, really if, do if you don't, if, you know, I introduced you as one of the best writers I've ever known in the Muslim world. Ah, billah, in the billah. Muslim world. So I know you've written many books. Uh, and just for my viewers, uh, if you can just share some of your books uh, okay. and then we can maybe reconvene in another time, especially I want to talk about Imam Jamil Amin's case. Okay. Um, 
but if you can maybe share some of the books you've written and maybe people can write to you an email if they're interested. So this is a book on Dr. Afia Siddiqui. Yeah, Dr. Afia and Siddiqui, telling... Other Voices. Um, then we have another book, The Message of Rachel Corey. This was the young yeah, American woman who was murdered by an IDF soldier, an Israeli Defense Forces soldier with a, with a specially made American bulldozer in 2000, March of 2003. This is a good book to give to Christians. Yes. And, yes. Uh, and, and because, you know, it's, it's talking about an American. So that whole Zionist plot needs to be like, can be, un, you know. And another book is, uh, <laughs> wow, State of the Union 2003. Don't say you didn't know. Yeah, I read, I read that, yeah. Um, Target Sudan was really behind yes. the crisis in Darfur. This is when Darfur was on the international map and getting yeah. a lot of attention. This was the first edition. We did a second edition, which was a bigger book. The first edition of our book, Why Our Children Are Killing Themselves. This was okay. way back when. This was way back when. And then uh, also Sacrilege in the Haramein, what happened in Mecca in 1407 of the Hijra in 1987. This was the year that I made uh, my pilgrimage by the grace and, oh. and mercy of Allah. And um, I witnessed what happened when over 400 people were killed by Saudi forces. SubhanAllah, it was just terrible. Oh, that's I wrote amazing. That, I witnessed report. And then um, this, this is the book that started it all. This was my very first book. It's a book of poetry and commentary entitled The Teacher. Mm. Yeah, this was my very first book. You also wrote there. one book on Zionism that I read. Yeah. You also wrote, have wrote that one book on uh, it's, you also it's, wrote uh, one book in, uh, in on Iraq. But those of you that can afford it, I would definitely tell you to, okay, Imam Jamil Amin. Yes. So those of you that can afford it, I would definitely tell you to get the book on Zionism, if you can write him an email for that. And his book, obviously, on Imam Jamil Amin, if you're, if you're, you know, that would be also good. Unfortunately, most of these books are out of print. I, I just got these surprise copies from my uh, the, the accountant for the Afia Foundation. He had these, uh, but most of these books, most of the books that I've written are out of print. Um, but inshallah ta'ala, we're, 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 our plan is to uh, reissue them. And so, um, you know, folks are interested. And in fact, but, but there are some that have to be updated. You know, why our children are killing themselves. That, that is a book that we want to update um, with, um, you know, new, most recent information, special, especially where it comes to the statistical data and what have you. And then, you know, a couple of other books that we want to update as well, inshallah ta'ala. But um, any anyway, last words, you, you, any last words you want to leave with us? Uh, yeah, I, I would, I would simply, um, like to encourage our brothers and sisters, um, I would like to echo what you just said, and, and thank you for that, Sheikh Omar. Um, our brothers and sisters who would like to share uh, in the blessings, in the, in, in the baraka of this um, human rights um, mobilization that's about to unfold in five cities. We really, really need support. One of the things that I'm hoping I will not have to do, and I won't have, inshallah ta'ala, I will not have to do this for Texas. It, you know, we, we've already got in, enough resource on hand that, um, you know, we won't have to um, be begging folk to support the effort uh, in Texas. If we can get folk to do that, that alhamdulillah, but we, will, we don't have to spend a lot of time requesting folks to give money. Texas is already covered. Uh, but uh, we still, after Texas, we're going to have three other um, uh, cities uh, uh, to mobilize in. And um, so if folks who really feel the burn, who really feel the, uh, the, the importance of this effort, if they can, if they're in a position to, if they can go to our website and make a donation via PayPal, you know, um, according to your means. It is one of the most meritorious forms of zakat or sadaka you can give. Our uh, work, the work that the Afia Foundation does, yeah, and, and, and on that note, you know, one of the one of the 
eight categories for zakat is people that are imprisoned. Right. And we don't usually get an opportunity, you know, because the sunnah should be to try to do a little bit for every category. So many of you that are watching this probably have never given any money for the purpose of taking prisoners out. So those people, this is your opportunity to give that zakat that you've never actually done. So that, that I just wanted to, you know, share that with you. And uh, yeah. this yeah, is, you, can do that. you know, you can live in America. And if you want to live honorably, then you have to stand up. That's right. And otherwise, right. you will always be seen as the other. That's and right. If you don't, if you don't exert yourself, you know, especially in this political system, if you don't exert yourself, you're a nobody, right? And only if you exert yourself, you uh, can get things done. I don't know what you would feel about that, but more, Brother Mori is an expert when it comes to this field of of understanding the political world and. Anyway, so inshallah, Jazakumullah uh, khairan, assalamu alaikum. Let's definitely do another one on Imam Jamil Amin. Okay, my brother. Thank you very much. Okay, inshallah. Uh, may Allah Ta'ala bless you, brother. And I've uh, always your wanted leadership. to do one with you. And so it took a little while, but alhamdulillah. Yeah, alhamdulillah. alhamdulillah. And you know something, are, are, are you still at, 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 uh, at I'm the- I'm in New York Western? now. Oh, you're in New York now? Yeah. What part of New York are you in, Aki? Are you in the city? Buffalo. Oh, you're in, oh, you're way up there. You're up in Buffalo, my child. Yeah. yeah. Well, it is, you know, I think the last time I was up in that area, brother, was it had to be at least 10 years ago. It was a visit I paid to Niagara Falls. Uh, right. Yes. Yeah, so if, if you ever come to Niagara Falls, you have to come by my house. So <laughs> inshallah, Tala, we'll do that. Inshallah. Okay, my brother. Thank okay, you very much. Assalamu alaikum. Allah bless you. Alaikum salam.